But yes, he is the former Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, and he's currently the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He is Admiral James Stavridis. Hello, Admiral. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday with us. Hi, Roshini. It's great to uh, be on the air with you. I'm back in Boston, uh, but I had a wonderful visit out in the Twin Cities at the talk you mentioned, and I'm thrilled to uh, have a chance to continue the conversation. You know, I'm looking at the program from that event on April 9th right now, and if I recall, you had a lot of people sort of with dropped jaws based on some of the statistics you were sharing when it comes to cybersecurity. What is the latest? I mean, what kind of update can you give us on where we as a nation stand when it comes to the threats against us? Well, I'm sorry to say we're extremely vulnerable. And just uh, in the last week, as I'm sure you noticed, the IRS uh, discovered that about 100,000 accounts were hacked through one of their websites by a cyber criminal gang operating out of Moscow. Uh, before that, we saw the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, 87 million accounts compromised uh, before that. I bet many of your uh, listeners have uh, a problem with either Target uh, or Home Depot credit cards off probably 60 million compromised. I could go on and on. So there's the cyber criminal part of it that's very concerning. And then secondly, at the national level, there's a whole series of cyber intrusions from both Russia, China, and I think the most public one was the attack on Sony Pictures by North Korea after the leader of North Korea was particularly outraged by, frankly, a very bad movie called The Interview that came out. So there are both national and cyber criminal activities that place us at great risk, and we see evidence of that every day. You know, and yet we day after day fill out forms to pay online, buy online. Uh, we add yet another social media account to our world. And yeah. all of those entities are asking for private data, Admiral. Yeah, and this is the, the balance, the trade-off. Uh, I think everyone who is active on the Internet would say they like it, they use it, they connect with their friends, they shop, they find information every single day, they apply for jobs, they apply for college. It's a wonderful tool that opens the world. But the dark side of globalization is the vulnerability it creates. So we need to think about how we can reap the benefits of interacting in the cyber world while we try and protect ourselves. And it's a delicate balance and uh, requires compromise on both sides. Yeah, and let's talk about some of the bright side of this technology, because I do remember you getting into that during your talk last month. So it has helped us become a more global population across, you know, nation to nation, right? Get into that a little bit. I can. Um, a, a good way to think about it is, Look at the global population. There are 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, today, there are about 9 billion devices connected to the Internet. By the end of 2016, there will be 15 billion devices connected to the Internet. Uh, there are 1.4 billion people on Facebook alone. Uh, if Facebook were a nation, it would be the largest nation in the world. More people are on Facebook than live in China. Um, that's so I pretty, so, I mean, that's a great analogy. I never really thought about it like that. We yeah, always think of what a powerhouse of people China is, and that says a lot about Facebook. Well, another way to put it is that uh, the seven most populous nations in the world, if you will, are Facebook, China, India, Twitter, the United States, and Indonesia. Wow. So uuh, these social networks are becoming increasingly like nations in that they connect people, they have value chains and value systems. And so that balance between what we think of traditionally as a sovereign state and these new actors, um, these social networks, is um, a pattern of behavior that really we haven't defined yet. And we're going to define it as we go through this uh, exciting but turbulent century. Yeah, and the thing, the the bright side of this is it, it opens us up to new cultures, new people, and we are learning. I mean, some people uh, uniquely get their, their news from 
Twitter. I mean, they're not even reading daily papers Absolutely. anymore. So that's where they're getting it. So some of these social networks, as we call them, uh, really do have a place for good. Or we find out how we can donate to the victims of the earthquake in Nepal or the floods in Texas. So that's definitely the positive. But then the dark side of it is how do the people that are supposed to protect us at every country level, how do they then deal with this? Exactly. So I'll tell you three things that we need to collectively be doing and thinking about if we're going to uh, protect ourselves from these vulnerabilities. One is we've got to get the different agencies of the U.S. government working more closely together, and that's always a challenge. But that means the Department of Homeland Security, which nominally has the lead on protecting this cyber infrastructure, needs to work more closely with the Department of Defense, which operates a huge cyber network both in and outside the United States, needs to work more closely with the FBI, the uh, Department of Revenue, the IRS. All of the actions and organs of government need to be more seamlessly integrated, and we just haven't managed to get that act together. Secondly, we've got to get better cooperation across private and public. In other words, so much of the front line in this cyber risk scenario is really borne by the financial institutions of the country, the big commercial banks, the big enterprises and businesses, the electrical grid. All of these are civilian private entities, and that connection between their risk and who's going to defend them on the government side has not been very well connected. So it's the interagency working together. It's private-public cooperating. And then lastly, and most controversially, we need better international cooperation. We've got to talk more with other governments, uh, break down some of the barriers and suspicions that exist, and find ways to cooperate to go after these cyber criminals. You know, we do this, that kind of international cooperation, we do that routinely when we want to go after people who are moving narcotics or human traffickers or counterterrorism. We need to think about the cyber world as a zone in which we have international cooperation as well. So those, I think, are the three keys. Very big. And I'm going to get into a couple of those with you uh, after our commercial break. I'm talking with, uh, he is the former commander, 16th Supreme Allied Commander at NATO. He oversaw operations in Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and the Balkans. And then after the 9-11 attacks, he led Deep Blue, the Navy's premier operational think tank for innovation. You can chat with him when we come back from break. Our number is 651-989-9226 or 866-989-9226. You can also text us at 81807. Our power talk for the month of May is Admiral James Stavridis. He's the dean of the Fletcher, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's also author of the Accidental Admiral. You can chat with him. Give us a call, 651-989-9226, 866-989-9226. You can also text 81807. Admiral, you've talked about how the entities in the U.S. really need to collaborate better and partner. And we saw that, you know, coming to such a head in 9-11 when, the, when data and all these things were not yep. really in line. And so the answer was Homeland Security and other things. But you've talked about a cybersecurity force, and you say 82 nations have that, and we don't. Indeed. Um, let's think back 100 years ago. We had an Army, a Navy, and a Marine Corps, but we didn't have an Air Force. Why did we not have an Air Force 100 years ago? Well, we didn't fly airplanes around. We then discovered that we needed an Air Force to defend the country. I think we're in the same situation today. Today we have an Army, a Navy, an Air Force, and a Marine Corps, but we don't have a cyber force, and yet that's where a great deal of our insecurity is coming. So I think we do need a military component that can defend us in the cyber world, because many other nations are taking these steps. And what would that look like? Where would it draw from? Yeah, I think it would be very different than the traditional armed forces we have today. It would be much smaller, much more elite. It would be uh, very gender balanced. It would be high-tech individuals. And it would probably have a different pay and benefit structure 
but it would be part of the military in that it would be defending the country. I think it would be small to begin with, perhaps five to 10,000 people. As you probably know, we have 1.5 million people in the armed forces. So this would be a very tiny component initially. But I think we could then see what the threat is, see what the military uh, responses as opposed to the civilian criminal response, as opposed to the private sector response, and then make a better estimate of the size component. But I'd say to begin with, over the next three to five years, we ought to be putting in place about a five to 10,000 person cyber force. All right. Now you've talked about some of the technical, you know, you mentioned the data breaches and things like that. Okay. So a lot right. of times people think of these crimes as cyber crime when something's been hacked and people get you at your private data. But you also talk about what could really be a full on cyber war where mm-hmm. a, a bad entity could get in and kill our, our, our uh, electricity grid or our water uh, exactly. to different cities. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think the the two most vulnerable parts of the infrastructure are the overall electrical grid, which is increasingly cyber dependent. And then secondly, the cyber networks themselves, which, uh, as you know, flow enormous amounts of data, our medical records move across them, our waterworks operate from them, our air transportation grid. So there are two key vulnerabilities there. And I am sorry to say that a number of patients um, are doing active planning for how to use cyber attacks to disrupt both the electrical grid specifically and the broader cyber connectivity of nations. We've seen this already, for example, in Estonia, uh, Georgia, as in the Republic of Georgia and the Caucasus, Latvia and Lithuania, all of whom have been subject to cyber attacks that came from by all estimates, uh, Russia. So this is a real component of warfare going forward. We need to do a lot better job preparing for it. And then all those billions of devices are could be uh, just useless if that whole power grid comes down. Exactly, right? exactly. So that's really the dark end of the spectrum. I think what you'll see long before you get to that kind of apocalyptic vision is a series of attacks against specific uh, geographic entities against specific financial institutions, against portions of the electrical grid. You'll see sort of probing actions to see what the vulnerabilities are. And we're already seeing that. The New York Stock Exchange is attacked perhaps a 100,000 times a month. Really? And, indeed. I, and I, I am given that data by the head of security information of the New York Stock Exchange. Wow. But so there are obviously things in place there that are, are protecting indeed. it. There, there are. And uh, there are enormous defensive systems that are in place. And uh, thus far, I think the balance is on the side of defense. But as these offensive tools become more uh, capable, I think that balance is going to shift toward the offense. And I think we've got some challenges ahead. Yeah, and I always ask, you know, why should the regular public care? And it comes down to safety, security, but it also comes down to money. So cybercrime is is more than about $2 trillion in our global economy of $60 trillion. So think about that. At least $2 trillion is just getting shaved off (laughs) in these kind of criminal structures, and that's only growing. Indeed. Uh, Another way to think of it is $1 out of every 30 in the global economy is touched by cyber criminal activity. And it's not only the loss of those revenues from legitimate businesses, but a a portion of that money goes to finance uh, violent extremism. It goes to finance these uh, movements that are antithetical to global society. There are a lot of secondary effects, and I would add to that corruption. A lot of that money goes to corrupting uh, many of these very fragile democracies in parts of the world like the Caucasus, like uh, Eastern Europe. Ukraine is subject to this. So this is um, something that I think everyone ought to know more about and worry more about. Um, And I'll give you a final reason to worry about it, because we've kind of talked about finances and your pocketbook. 
we've talked about national security and our electrical grid. Let's recall that this is very personal. Um, when people's information is hacked, um, it touches the most intimate parts of their lives. And a good example of this is the movie actress Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Academy Award winner, uh, posted some very intimate photographs of herself. She thought in a very secure way in the iCloud, hacked those photographs globally, distributed um, enormous embarrassment and damage to a young woman uh, who, who said she felt as though she'd been raped. Um, those kind of intimate personal vulnerabilities are also part of the calculus, why it matters to each of us. Yeah, that really does bring it home. I'm talking with retired Navy Admiral James Stavridis. He was the 16th Supreme Allied Commander at NATO. He's currently Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. What is the Deep Web, Admiral? The Deep Web, or sometimes called the Dark Web, is a an, is a part of the overall Internet that is impossible to access without uh, very specific high-level crypto abilities. And it is the portion of the web where the vast majority of illicit activities occur. It's where you can go on the web in order to buy the software, the computer programs that allow you to conduct this kind of cybercrime. It's the part of the web where you can buy narcotics. It's the part of the web where you can buy human beings. Uh, humans are trafficked in this part of the web, this dark web. And it's kind of a misnomer to think of it as a place. It's really a series of techniques that allow an individual or an organization to get into a protected zone within the web. Um, law enforcement's very aware of it, but the bad guys are constantly changing and shifting those tools, conducting their own cyber defenses of the dark web. And it's a place where cyber crime and cyber security meet and do battle today. Yeah, well, it is. It sounds very. It sounds like it can only expand as technology keeps growing. Exactly, and and again, let's go back to the number of devices connected to the web as those manifest and double and triple in the within this decade. Um, those devices are controlling each other, and the autonomy of the web grows and grows, which, again, as we've talked about, has a lot of benefit. It creates productivity gains, but it also creates vulnerability because you've taken the person out of the loop, and therefore the technology can be inserted, and then manipulation can occur of this Internet of Things, as it is often called. All right, Admiral, really quickly, I know this is some serious stuff, but is there any just really just basic advice you can give our listeners that, you know, I don't want to scare everybody, but this is real serious stuff? Yeah, the thing I would suggest, and this is a fact, is that 60% of all the bad things we've talked about today occur because of breakdowns in simple computer hygiene which is that really boring, annoying stuff like having a powerful password with a lot of different characters and up and down case and so on, not changing that password frequently, not buying basic software to protect your accounts, uh, type into uh, any search engine, uh, computer hygiene, best practices. There'll be lists of 10 things you can do, 15 things you can do, 20 things you can do. Do them. They're as fundamental as the basics of hygiene that your mom taught you. You can at least uh, start when. to protect yourself in this way. You can indeed, and you can you can you can strengthen your position, and the bad guys will go on to softer targets. A lot of this can be done by you yourself. All right. Thank you so much. He is our May Power Talk, Admiral James Stavridis, author of The Accidental Admiral, currently at Tufts University. Pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks for all the great information.